to be in a state where by grace and grace alone you have been saved from eternal condemnation and given eternal life is one of the best things that can ever happen to you. But there's something that's better. In the 17th century, there was a man by the name of Thomas Brooks, a preacher, and he wrote a, a book called Heaven on Earth. And in that book, uh, this is basically his argument. He says, it is an amazing thing to have heaven after this life. It is an even more amazing thing to know that you have heaven after this life. It, it, it is one thing to be in a state where we uh, experience the grace of God in our life and we will experience heaven. It is another thing, a greater joy to know, have confidence that we actually do indeed have that. He titled his book Heaven on Earth because he says when you know, when you really know that you actually have the joy of eternal life set before you, it, it is not just a, the joy of heaven then, it brings a heaven-like joy now. It brings heaven on earth. To, to have that kind of confidence that indeed you will have eternal life. And I think part of the reason why it brings that kind of heaven-like joy is because oftentimes we don't feel that we know for sure that it's true. We wonder and worry and we, we see in the Bible these, these commands, these calls, even as we've looked through 1 John, these things that we are called to that say, if you are a Christian, you will act this way. And many of us, we, we kind of get worried, we become overwhelmed, we become burdened because we say, I'm not sure if I meet that standard. I, I'm not quite sure if I'm good enough. And so there's, there's this anxiety that builds in our heart. Am I, am I really a Christian? Am I, am I really saved? I'm not sure. And we're walking through life day after day wondering, not sure, not confident. And so the question really is, is how do we know? How do we know that we will have the eternal life that we so often talk about? It's one of the questions that John deals with throughout his letter, and he again addresses it today. And we'll see, uh, we have basically one main point for the whole sermon, and it's this. The main truth that I think John wants to teach us is that true spiritual life is known by love for other Christians. How you know whether or not you have that true spiritual life, it's known by love for other Christians. Uh, so let me read the whole text. Uh, I'm going to start in verse 10. We'll read all the way through. It's a little bit longer, uh, but just uh, we'll read through it, and then we'll go through it uh, bit by bit. So 1 John 3, verse 10 says this. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death, into life, because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart 
and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So again, main truth for today, true spiritual life is known by love for other Christians. And we we see that uh, come up uh, in the text throughout, but especially in verse 14, it's really the key main point that John is making. He says there, uh, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. He uses the words one another, brothers and sisters, the, the family of God, the church. Whoever does not love abides in death. And so John uses this image that's common uh, in the New Testament, that of death and life, to talk about our spiritual state. Paul writes in Ephesians 2 that we are dead in our sins and trespasses, and then God comes and he makes us alive together with Christ. And so it's this idea that that spiritually we have no actual real spiritual life in us uh, by nature. There's nothing there. We cannot love or glorify God truly. And then God comes and does something to us, grants us faith. We believe in him. And then we, we, we are passed from death into spiritual life. And it, his point is that this spiritual life evidences itself in love. He says we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. And so it's important to note that he he doesn't say the way that you pass from death to life is love. It's not the way. Love is not the way you pass from death to life. Love is how you know whether or not you have passed from death to life. I think this is a different than somewhat the common understanding of Christianity uh, for many people in our culture. Uh, I, uh, a few years ago, did a survey uh, for one of my uh, school classes where I went around and kind of asked uh, people different questions, what they thought about the church, when I kind of interviewed them, 10 or so questions, uh, what do you think about this and that. One of the main questions that I would always ask is, uh, what do you think the main message of Christianity is? If you just had to summarize what you think it is. Some of these people, they were not Christian, some were, uh, some were not. They were, you know, uh, Muslim, uh, atheist, uh, very just non-religious. What was interesting is how they all summarized it. Uh, When I asked the question, uh, no one mentioned Jesus. No one mentioned the forgiveness of sins. No one mentioned grace. They all said something uh, very similar to the effect of the main message of Christianity uh, is love people. Be kind to others. Uh, Be nice. Be a good person. That is the main message of Christianity. Do good things and you'll be rewarded. Uh, Don't do bad things or you'll be punished. That's how they understood what Christianity was. They understood that there is, you know, spiritual death. You don't don't have any spiritual life. And the way through which you pass into a spiritual enlightenment or to be a spiritual person, the way you move that way is by beginning to love other people. You you do the things that you you should be doing. That's how you would become one who has spiritual life. But John doesn't say that. He doesn't say that love is the way we pass. He says love is the way we know that we already have passed. It's like the difference between a a thermostat and a thermometer. A thermostat, you know, you have it in your home. And I I know thermostats now have a thermometer built in and there's a digital thing. It's all fancy. But just for the sake of the illustration, separate things, okay? Thermostat controls the temperature in your home. Thermometer reads the temperature. You know, one of those little fancy things goes up and down. Nobody has those anymore. They're cool, though. Um, (laughs) Thermostat. If you want to turn up the temperature in your home, you go and you turn up the dial. You turn it up. You turn up the heat. Kicks on the furnace. Furnace begins moving, moving air throughout the home. Your house begins to heat up. The way you know whether the house is indeed hot enough is you look at the thermometer. The thermometer shows you if the temperature has actually risen. Here's the thing you don't do, though. You're feeling cold in your home, and you go to your thermometer and try and turn up the heat. It doesn't make any sense because a thermometer doesn't control the heat. The thermometer only tells you what the heat is. It shows you whether or not the heat has been turned on. The thermostat is how you actually turn on the heat. And John is making a similar point. 
He's saying love is not the way. It's like the thermometer. It's not the way you actually pass from death to life. It just simply shows you whether that's happened or not. The way through which you pass from death to life is through faith in Christ and Christ alone. There is no other way through which we can pass. We believe that Jesus has died for our sin, that he has forgiven us on the cross, and we believe and trust that that is how we pass from death to life. The way we know whether that has happened is our love for other Christians. We, to use the example, we, we turn up the heat of our spiritual lives through faith in Christ. The way that we check if the heat is turned on is through our love for other Christians. And if the thermometer, our love for other Christians, reads cold, it means, as John says, we still abide in death. The, the furnace of our spiritual life has not actually been turned on. And so if we ask the question, well, what kind of love then does John expect? What's this love supposed to look like? Well, he tells us in the next few verses, and in fact, he paints a contrast. A contrast uh, between what the children of the devil look like and what the children of God looks like. And he uses as an example Cain and Jesus. Look first at Cain. He says in verse 12, We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. Why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Uh, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. And so he uses this uh, Cain and Abel uh, story, which maybe you're familiar with, of the, the first two sons that were born. The older came and murdered the younger because he was kind of jealous of the sacrifice he offered. So when you read it, it seems obvious. Don't be like Cain. Don't be a murderer. Great. Check. But then look at what he says in verse 15. He says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And so the logic is, hey, we all say, a murderer, there's no eternal life abiding in that person. It's pretty obvious. But he says, but you realize, though, that, that hatred, those who hate their brother, is a murderer. At which we might say, well, that seems like a bit of a jump, a bit of a leap, John, to say that. But it's exactly the same point that Jesus makes in the Sermon on the Mount. He says that, you know, the, the lust of our eyes is the same as committing adultery. That, that anger deserves the same punishment as murder. It's the same logic that John uses. And again, he's not saying that, that murder is exactly the same as hatred. Thank goodness. But he is saying they come from the same heart. See, hatred desires that something bad would happen to someone else, usually for our own sense of satisfaction. If there's somebody that we can think of that we hate at work or school, we, we, we kind of want them to get what's coming to them. We want them to be exposed, to be shown who they are. We want something bad to happen to them, whether we do it or not, because it gives us some sense of satisfaction. There would be justice then. Those per people deserve that. And, and even if we don't want to do them directly harm, we, we kind of want them to be gone out of our life, right? You know, that person at work that you really are frustrated with, you, would, you just kind of wish they would just get a new job, they get moved to a new department, or you want them gone, you know, the, the person at school, you want them moved to a different class, the person in your family you wish you could just kind of cut off or they'd move to a different city, we want them gone out of our life which in the end is kind of what the murderer wants. They want this person gone out of their life. And so it's not to say that these are exactly the same, but the, the heart from which they spring is the same. And John's point is Christians should not be characterized by that. They should be characterized by something very different, by love. See, hatred, hatred usually seeks out our benefit, often at the expense of others. But love is exactly the opposite. See, love seeks out others' benefit, often at the cost of ourselves. And, and John shows us the ex extreme example of this in Jesus. In verse 16, he says this, By this we know love. How do we know what love is like? He said that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us. 
and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. So it, it, the picture of love that he expects of Christian is this sacrificial giving love that gives to others for their benefit at the expense of themselves. But he doesn't just stop there. He continues, and he says in verse 17 and 18, uh, not just that we say we love people, but that that love we say we have actually expresses itself. Look at what he writes. He says, but if anyone has the world's goods, we have the things that we need, essentially, and he sees his brother in need, and yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. John is saying, it's easy to say we love people. It's hard to actually love people. It's easy to be like, yeah, I, I love the brothers and sisters in Christ in my church. But then when it, it comes to actually having to sacrifice to give up our time or energy or resources for those kinds of things, that's when it actually becomes difficult. It's easy to talk about or, or think about, but on the ground practically, that's where we need to see it take action. You'll notice, though, that the, the thing that he calls the people to do is not some extraordinary thing. He does say, Jesus, you know, we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers, but the example he gives is, is not somebody actually sacrificing his life. It's just a simple thing, a simple act of kindness, of generosity, of caring for those around them who had needs. A few years ago, uh, there was a seminary in the United States uh, that decided to kind of uh, do an experiment, so to speak, with their students. And so they separated the students into two groups of people. Uh, the first group of people, they said, hey, there is a famous New Testament scholar who's coming to speak at chapel in a week, uh, and he's going to be speaking on the parable of the Good Samaritan, you know, the parable in which there's a man by the side of the road, and somebody comes and helps him, and the idea is that you should love your neighbor uh, in the story. So, Go, study, read the commentaries, be prepared for next week. They go off. Other group of people, they don't tell them anything. They just say, hey, next week, there's going to be a famous New Testament scholar who's going to be giving an exposition of the Bible. Great. These two groups go. On the day of the, the chapel, as people are heading into the chapel on the, the path through, they place an actor there. The actor uh, is given some clothes, uh, has like long, straggly hair, looks like he's been out on the street for a while, a little bit rough. They put makeup on his face so it seems like he's a little bit bleeding, kind of holding his head, uh, groaning. And all the students are going past. And they wanted to see uh, which of these two groups would have the higher percentage of people that would stop for this man. The group that knew they were going to hear the story of the Good Samaritan, who had studied it, read about it that week, or the group that simply knew nothing about it. Th these were seminary students, people who knew the Bible well, hopefully were s somewhat mature in their faith, uh, which two groups do you think had the higher percentage of people that stopped for the man? It was exactly the same. It was exactly the same. Not a statistical difference at all. Incredible, isn't it? These people had been studying all week on this parable, and yet it didn't actually affect the way they lived. It, it's easy to say we love but it's hard to actually love. I'm sure the same is true in many of our own lives. There's many things we know, we hear about on a Sunday, and we can go home on the afternoon and, and things might not look different. It doesn't seem to be put into action, and that's where John is pressing us. He's pressing us to say it's not enough to just simply say you love, that love needs to be expressed in action for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, at which point we may say, it's great that John thinks that Christians need to be defined by this kind of love, but aren't there other communities out there that also love people within their own community, their own tribe of people? I isn't that common as well? I mean, we know other religious communities where people seem to really love each other in that community. You know, communities that are defined by their, their culture or their shared interest. These communities seem to genuinely love one another. What's so different about the Christian community then? Well, a few things, hopefully, should be different. 
a Christian community should love across boundaries. See, many of these other communities that exist often uh, exist because of their shared interest or their commonality in culture, uh, in where they grew up, in the things that they like to do. But Christianity should be, have people from all different cultures, backgrounds, interests, united, loving one another across those boundaries. You should have people sitting down the row from you who vote different from you and you still love them. You should have, you have people down the row that have a, a vastly different cultural background than you, that value some things you think are a little bit uh, you know, different than what you would value, and yet you still sacrificially love them. See, because Jesus draws people from every nation, tribe, language, people, and he brings them all together to show his glory in a people that love one another. But not only that, but this love, it, it should be an extravagant kind of love. Right, a lay-down-your-life kind of love for one another. It is to our shame that other communities can outlove Christians. I mean, from the very beginning of the church, Christians have been marked by their love. I mean, you think about the early church in Acts chapter 2. As soon as Peter begins preaching and the gospel you know, gathers a group of people together, what is this group of people doing? Well, they're gathering together to pray, to meet together in the temple, in their homes, and they're selling their possessions, giving to any who had need. Wh whoever in the church has need, they're just like, here you go. They're, they're selling lands and properties and giving to one another. Why? Because they're just sacrificially loving because that's what you do. But it wasn't just that, you know, that Acts chapter 2 church, even in the following centuries to come, Christians continue to be marked by this kind of sacrificial love. There's a historian, uh, E.R. Dodds, he's not a, a Christian uh, historian, but he writes, kind of looking from his perspective, uh, what is the thing that really helped Christianity rise to the surface in those first few centuries? What was it that happened? Of course, as Christians, we would say, well, it was the power of God working as the gospel was proclaimed, but what were the means through which God used? Well, one of them that E.R. Dodd seems to highlight is this love. Look at what he says. He says, a Christian congregation was from the first a community in a much fuller sense than any corresponding group of Isaac or Mithraist devotees, those pagan gods, its members were bound together not only by common rights, but by a common way of life. A love for one's neighbor is not an exclusively Christian virtue, but in this period, Christians appear to have practiced it much more effectively than any other group. The church provided the essentials of social security, but even more important, I suspect, than these material benefits was the sense of belonging which the Christian community could give. And so he looks at that community and he says there, there was this radical love that they cared for one another and that seems to be why this church grew. They seem to be defined by it. And in fact, that's exactly what we would expect because Jesus in John 13 tells us how his disciples should be known. He writes to them in the upper room after washing their feet, he says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. And by this, this love, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. John expects that for Christians, love of other Christians is characteristic. Dogs bark Cows moo, Christians love. That, that should just be who we are. It's just like in our DNA that we naturally love other Christians because we've been united to a God who is love. If, if you see a dog that doesn't bark, you're like, something's probably wrong. If you see a Christian that doesn't love, something's probably wrong. And again, the, the point, though, is not that the love is the thing that makes us who we are. The love is simply the evidence of it. It's, it's like a light bulb. When the light bulb is giving off its light, you know that there is an electrical current that is running to the light. The light shows 
proves that there is power running to that light. When Christians love, it shows that there is a spiritual current running in the Christian soul. That there is a power that is running through us that is not our own, and that's why we love. We give off this light, the light of the world. So, true spiritual life is known by love for other Christians. Let me ask you, do you feel that's true of you? Does what John says should characterize Christians characterize us? See, there are two responses that we can feel to that question. Response number one is that we feel uh, absolutely guilty that that's not true of us. We, we feel condemned, in fact, that, man, we do not love the way we should. Or, or the other option is we, we see that with the call to love and we say, although I love imperfectly, I do genuinely love the brothers and sisters around us and we're encouraged. And what's interesting is with both of those two responses, John speaks, in fact, to both of them in the rest of our passage. He speaks to both those who feel weighted down and condemned, and he speaks to those who feel encouraged. Look first to those who feel condemned. I think for many of us, we hear this text spoken, explained, and we feel weighted down. We, we see the, the uh, very high calling and we, we feel that we don't measure up to that. We, we, we can think of times in our life where we haven't loved the brothers and sisters around us, where there have been people in need and we've passed them by so many times. And we again just wonder, am I really even a Christian? Or we feel this sense of condemnation. I mean, even if we're here and we're, we're not a Christian, we might still feel that same kind of thing. Maybe not specifically about love, but in general, we feel that there's there's a, a guilt in our heart that we don't seem to be able to get rid of. That we, we, we know deep down we haven't been living the way we ought. We, we want to get rid of it. We want to kind of push that feeling away. We don't want it. So we kind of say, you know what? The reason I'm feeling this way is because there's these societal pressures that say I need to be this way or there's these religious pressures that say I need to be this way and uh, those are wrong because we don't want to feel bad about it. And yet even when we do that, there's, there's something that if we look deep in our hearts, we know we should be a better person than we are. And the fact that we aren't really haunts us. We, we know there's something better we're called to, and we're not there. And it, it feels as if our, uh, our conscience is like a judge slamming down the, the gavel, guilty, guilty, guilty. What does John say to those people? Look at verse 19. He says, by this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, it's our heart, our conscience saying, yeah, we're actually guilty. God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. The, the, the first thing that we see, maybe if we have this feeling, is that it, it may be actually a right feeling. We, we should acknowledge that first off, that maybe part of the reason we feel condemned, uh, that we don't love other Christians, is that we actually don't. There's actually not a love in our heart for those around us, and it shows exactly what John says it shows. It shows that we still abide in death. And if that is us, I, I hope you would see, though, that the solution in that case is, is not simply that you need to love more. It's not, hey, I don't have love in my life, Therefore, I need to be better at loving. Remember back to the thermostat and thermometer. If it's cold in the room, don't adjust the thermometer. Adjust the thermostat. You need to actually pass out of death into life. That's why there's no love in your life. And the solution to that, John says, is faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. 
that on the cross, Jesus would actually go and take all of the punishment and all of the condemnation and all of the guilt that you feel, all of the actual punishment for those things he took upon himself. So that even though we try and push away the feelings of guilt and condemnation by lowering the expectations, by pretending they don't exist, Jesus says, no, they do exist, and you've fallen short, and I will take all of the punishment upon myself. And when he does that, he grants us his verdict. The verdict that he deserves for his perfect life, not one of guilty, but of innocent. And we receive that by faith. When we believe that truth, that is how we pass from death to life. So that may be the case for some of us here. But for others of us, probably more of us, I would suspect, those who feel burdened and weighed down, we we need to remember exactly how our conscience is designed. See, our conscience, by its very nature, is going to be more likely to condemn us than not. When we hear this passage read, when you hear someone up in front tell you, this is all the ways you are supposed to love, what do you immediately think? Well, I didn't do it here, I didn't do it here, didn't do that, didn't do that. Your natural response is, well, I did that, I did that, I did that, I did that. It's more often than not, here are all the holes. Here are all the ways that I've fallen short. But look again at what John says in verse 19. He's writing to reassure Christians. He says, by this we shall know we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. When it says God is greater than at heart, it means our heart has rendered a verdict on our lives. Guilty. You haven't lived up to it. But when it says God is greater than at our heart, it means he can deliver a better verdict because he is a better judge. Our our hearts, by its very nature, do not have all of the evidence before us. When we make a verdict about ourselves, we often think of all those things in which we've done wrong. We haven't brought all the witnesses to the stand. Not all the evidence has been examined, and yet God is the Supreme Court. He's a better judge than our own heart because he knows everything. He knows all of the things in our life, even the ones that don't immediately come to mind when we hear those things. He he knows all the ways in which we've loved sacrificially. He knows the ways in which we've gone and made meals for those in the congregation. The the ways we've cared for those who are going through grief. He, He knows the ways in which we've just given for free our professional services to just help and support and build up other people. The way we drive people here to church and to Bible study. the the way we care for one another. He sees all of those things, those things that don't often come to our minds right away, the ways in which we do actually really love our brothers and sisters. He sees all of those things. And so the application for us is God is a greater judge. Entrust the verdict to him. Do do not always be weighed down by your own conscience and your own feelings of, am I good enough? Have I loved enough? I don't know whether I'm a Christian because I don't know if I've loved enough. No, 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 no. God knows everything. He's a greater judge. He will render the correct verdict. Because some of us, we, we really struggle. We struggle day after day. We have for many years. Perhaps we will continue just this constant sense of inadequacy, of worry, of wondering, am I truly saved? And it it bogs down almost everything that we do. We're always doubting, always wondering if the amount of love we've shown is enough. We don't feel that we can know for certain. This is what I would say to that. Uh, Your eternal salvation does not depend on the certainty of you knowing that you have eternal salvation. Your eternal salvation depends on the certainty that Christ has died for your sins. See, it's not about, hey, I'm saved if I can know that I actually did all the things, if I can actually read my thermometer correctly. You know what, if your thermometer's smashed, if you've lost it, if you don't know where it is and you can't figure it out, guess what? If the room's been turned up, if the heat is up, it's still hot, and God knows that. Right? Sometimes we look at the thermometer and we try to figure it out and we say, I don't know if my life actually lines up. 
we don't need to necessarily have certainty about that in order to actually be certainly saved. Does that make sense? There may be an uncertainty in our minds as we think, as we wrestle with, do we love enough? But there is no uncertainty in God's mind. God knows. He is a greater judge than our hearts. So in all of this, we leave God, the verdict to God. The one, the one who said that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. He doesn't say there is no condemnation for those who have loved enough. He says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The way we know we are in Christ is our love, but sometimes we don't know. But if we are in him, that statement is true. You do not have to feel that you don't have condemnation to not have condemnation. It is an objective reality that God has declared and that we hope and we long for to experience, but sometimes don't. But the last group of people that John addresses, though, these are the people who, when they hear that we are to love one another, think about their lives and, and they're genuinely encouraged because they know that, although imperfectly, they, they actually love the people around them. There's a real heart for that that isn't just expressed in words, but they see it in their lives in action, in deed. And this is what he says to them. He says, beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. This is an amazing thing. We can have confidence before God. If we see in our lives that, yes, there is love that is displayed for other Christians, there is a confidence when we come before God yet that, yes, we are his. We belong to him. And we have access to him in prayer. He says, whatever you ask, we receive from him. Which doesn't mean we can just ask willy-nilly for whatever we want. We'll unpack it more later in, in, the, in the letter when we get to it in chapter 5. He'll say the same thing again, over again. But there is an expectation that we can have in prayer as we come before God, a confidence before the living God, the one whom we should be condemned of and we come now with no condemnation because we see in our lives the furnace has been turned on. There is a love. There's a desire. There's a passion that we want to actually love those around us. We're looking for ways. How can we serve people in the church? It's just our heartbeat. How can we love others and what confidence we have? Confidence that we indeed have been brought out of death into life. That's what we want, isn't it? Don't, don't we want to see God so work in our life that our, that our heart is just burning with passion for others and we can see tangibly the evidence of God manifesting his love through us in the way we love other brothers and sisters such that we have a confidence before him? That we can say, yes, I do love the brothers and sisters. My heart doesn't condemn me. See, then we know. We know then that we have true spiritual life. And that, my friends, that is heaven on earth. Let me pray. Oh, Father, thank you that you have poured out your love to us. And Lord, we ask for your help and your spirit's work such that we might love others not to earn anything from you, but simply to display the goodness and the glory of your name. Help us as a church to love one another sacrificially, to care for one another. And we ask for those who are weak and whose consciences seem heavy, that today you would uplift them as they look unto Christ. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.